Hey guys, Will here. Just to let you know, this episode was recorded in one sitting, but I have broken it up into a two-parter due to length. Sorry for the delay. I have been absolutely slammed with other projects and not been able to update it, but we are going to try to get back to a regular recording schedule as soon as possible. Thanks and enjoy the episode. You stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking, Hello, greetings, and welcome once again to the Scruffy Nerf Herders podcast. I am your humble host, Josh, and joined again, as always, because he has nothing better to do, is my good friend Will. Do I have nothing better to do? I mean, I could be printing out a lightsaber for you right now. I mean, true, uh, but if you weren't on this call with me right now, you would just be drinking alone printing that lightsaber. I mean, that and playing Cyberpunk 2077 again, because I, I saw that. I have a very, I have a very fascinating life. <laughs> Look, we record these things on a Thursday. It has been a long week. We are tired. I feel like we just got back yesterday. <laughs> We didn't just get back yesterday. I I, I swear we got just got back yesterday. Here's the thing: if you had told me yes, I, I'd believe you. <laughs> Josh, it's Tuesday. We just got back yesterday. Dear God, Fourth of July. It's Fourth of July, Josh. Oh, man, I wish. I wish. I need more time off. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, as as we're all sort of alluding to, um, we just got back from End War 2023. We have a, a fair amount to say about it. If you look down at the timestamp below, you'll probably see exactly how much we have to say about that, give or take 10 minutes for the news. But it's, uh, it's a lot. A lot happened. A lot of good, a lot of bad, a lot of okay. But before we jump into it, um, let's, let's kind of just break down and see, uh, are, are we doing anything fun this week? Are we doing any, uh, any mods, any builds? What are we working on? To be honest, I'm taking a break from pretty much everything on the hobby for a week just to refresh my batteries because otherwise i am going to be struggling to put anything together <laughs> <laughs> i mean i did technically do a mod today just to sate our curiosity i mentioned previously that i had ordered carbon fiber tubing to see if it would make an acceptable placement for the plunger tube on a guru pro long shot turns out it does if anybody's interested i will throw the link down in the description so you can purchase your own it takes about a month to get here but it works and it looks nice so yeah also the specifications will be in the in that link so if you want to find something equivalent with the same outer and inner diameters they'll work and uh once i have recharged my batteries i'm going to be starting to print off the body for an fdl3 dear lord help me <laughs> yeah you are Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we talked about that on the last episode, but uh, we had a, a, a local war that we went to, and I, uh, I brought down an FDL for you to use, and the second you picked it up, I'm pretty sure you needed to change your pants. No, no. My eyes just caught fire because they were trying to light up so much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's fair. That's fair. But yeah, so I, I totally feel feel you on that well i genuinely wish i could take a week off but i don't have the quit in me i can't i have i think 50 different clubs i have to run now i think we're i think we're in 50s it yeah, feels definitely. like 50 <laughs> i will i will start helping you with more stuff on that in august but i can't do anything until august because i am too busy doing multiple jobs and family vacation and all that jazz so i feel you man don't worry. I just I run all of the Georgia Nerf. It's okay. <laughs> and I guess Brad helps too down in Spalding. But that's beside yeah. the point. <laughs> Love you, Brad. We'll talk about Brad more later. So yeah, we went to End War, everybody. End War 2023. The very, very slapdash put together event that usually we have six-ish months to to figure out and plan. I think usually it's between six and like maybe four months. This is when we usually figure it out. Well, due to some fiascos and some problems, we had six weeks from announcement to start date. That's not a lot of time. No, not a lot of time. I will say, you know, part of the reason it's so slapdash is they had six weeks. 
I, I will say in defense, it does not entirely feel like it was slapdashed in six weeks. It, it does not feel that rushed, at least from the, the moderator's point of view, from the organizers. I think UNCC hvz had everything very down pat i think they were very well organized and at least from my my experience and my understanding of previous uh, hvzs this one actually was probably the best put together that i've ever known of since like maybe 2018 2017 like one of the earlier end wars so uh yeah that's what i've heard i mean as we mentioned previously this was my first one so i can't comment too much on it but that's what I heard. That's fair. Here, let's uh for for just a quick review on a scale of one to ten, one being the worst thing in the possible world, and ten being the best event you've ever been to. Where would you put this on a scale of one to ten? I'd put it at a solid five, and part of that is just my own personal experience. I had some issues early on, and that just kind of snowballed. Yeah, you did. There. So, uh, <laughs> you know, not quite what I hoped. But I'd be willing to go back and do it again. I would actually, I look forward to doing it again because yeah. now that I've done it, I feel like I can be much better prepared and make some definite changes to my plans and loadout and all the rest oh, for of sure. it. I, I think we'll, we'll bring that up at the end too of like, now that we've, we've done end war again, cause I haven't done end war in three years. Like 2019 was my last time. So it's almost four years actually. Mm -hmm. So it's been a minute myself. So yeah, I think at the end of this, we'll we'll have a in retrospect 2020 vision. Like, what would we have done differently? Slash, what are we planning to do next time? Excellent. Yeah. So uh, let's go ahead and just break this down. The the only real uh, thing we can't talk about ourselves, which is both good and bad, is neither of us and not many of our friends uh, made it to the first day of End War, which was FOMCON. Obviously, because it was only six weeks of prep time, that's only six weeks for people to figure out if they're going to be able to do vending and stuff. So FOMCON itself did not have a spectacular turnout. I think there was about 12-ish vendors that were supposed to show up, and a few, I think, had to drop out last minute. But it was still interesting. I heard Mr. Nathan was there, which is a uh, very old, prolific modder in the community. If you've ever had one of his rainbow pumps, he's like the best in the game silver fox was there containment crew was there um i know our friends orca team with edmund he was there they were doing some stuff but for the most part foam con not not a lot going on yeah i will say dart zone was there and they had some very exciting stuff with them that we will get to talk about once we talk about fbt right beyond that i think everything else was done very well and again I got to say charlotte showed up they represented and they did a very good job for this event exactly yeah, Saturday morning. Uh, the event is supposed to start at, I think it was 10 o'clock, right? Yeah, was that sounds right. I think Blaster Check started at 8.30. A blaster Check was at 9, that's right, sorry. We had a couple of things change last minute. And I'm not going to lie, after having to work all day Friday, leave early, round up everybody I'm supposed to drive up there, get to the hotel Friday night, get everybody organized, pack up all of my gear and like get that ready for the morning and then get up and go. I, I don't think I stopped moving until Saturday afternoon. And even then my brain didn't get to stop. I, I took on the very, very arduous task of nerf daddy uh, this, this weekend, I think is what they started calling me. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I ended up having to organize and make sure everybody had the blasters, make sure everyone had their eye pro. I kept on having to go into all the rooms to check to make sure they were awake, that everyone was ready. I had to make sure some of our friends weren't hung over. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and it just like, just for my own sanity, it was, it was quite insane. But circling back, nine o'clock rolls around. We get there, we start checking in blasters, and I hope I can get that the, the footage because I loved our blaster check-in time frame. And Will, you got to miss it, but you probably saw the video I did. from our blaster check-in. <laughs> we get into check-in and uh, the, the FPS cap is 130, and so they got to make sure all the blasters are 130. We, we, get, we get everything blaster checked in, we go in for briefing for the rules and everything. We then, right before 10 o'clock hits, they send us up into the briefing rooms which are just the rooms in the student union. And that's where we started to have a bit of a problem. We find out later. Yeah. We, we ended up going to the briefing room and we're all sitting there hanging out. Everyone's trying to get organized. It's taken a little while. So the moderator walks in, uh, starts going over the, the rules and, and everything for, for mission one. Unfortunately, they do kind of miss 
going over what the special zombies are and what some of the more specific rules for HVZ are. You know, most of us were pretty experienced or we had kind of explained the rules to, you know, our friends. Will, you being included, I sat down and kind of went over like the standard zombies, which we'll come to find out aren't all accurate for this event. And we'll go over that in a minute. Yep. And we we break down the rules and the the long and short of it is all around campus, there are these artifacts, which are these random items duct taped with gold tape. Big, shiny gold pieces of whatchamahoosits, all themed around Greco-Roman mythology because that's the, the theme for the event. Awesome, cool, fantastic. And the only other thing on that piece of paper is bring those artifacts back to the armory, which is uh, right outside the student union in a place that is lovingly called the kill box. And the only thing we have to do is we have to bring back all the artifacts before the hour is up. Beyond that, the last bit of information on that piece of paper was, by the way, there are special zombies marked by sashes. A reward will be given if you can remove the sash, I believe is what the, the wording was. Yes. That, that is all the information we are given for mission one and they send us on our merry way. Oh, also we can only be in uh, no larger than groups of 10 to start. So our lovely group of like 20 that we ended up having uh, we got split up into two separate teams, which was when everything went wrong. <laughs> Additionally, they did ask for volunteers to be zombies just for mission Correct. one. That's right. Which a few of our members did, and I am really wishing I had volunteered to do. But since I had my partner with me who has been to exactly one SCNC and no other nerfing events, I did not want to leave my partner alone with the group and run off to be a zombie yeah i didn't think about that either but so they they did ask for uh at least one person from every group to uh give a sacrificial uh oz that person would then after mission one get to come back into mission two and so on and play the rest of the time now in hindsight those people did have the sweet gig for the day I know that because mm -hmm. one of one of our buddies, Trenton, love you to death, my guy, uh, made it to the finals. If I'm not mistaken, he at least made it to mission four, if not survived the whole day. He was last stand. He did, he did make it to last stand. So points points to OZ Trenton, uh, love you to death, my guy. So yeah, they 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 round up the OZs. They all go through everything. They're sent out on their merry way, and all groups are released in batches of ten, and we're we're set out onto the campus and. Like I said, we had two groups of people. One group went ahead of us. We had to hold back because of one of the rules they had. One of our members couldn't bring their gear into the student union, so we had to let him load everything back up onto him. So we had about a five-minute delay, longer than our, our original group that was with us. So they ended up going out to we only know where for the first 10 minutes. We gear up, get going, and that's when we realized that this is going to be a huge problem. We end up crossing the street, a couple of zombies start chasing us, and we get immediately lured into a kill box, and the ten people who were with us go down to five real quick. And this is where I get a front row seat to Will, Shell, your partner, Angus, and I'm so sorry, Angus's partner, all four of you getting knocked in the first five minutes. Yeah, part of the problem is we didn't stay with the main group. We tried to take the ramp because I was trying to avoid stairs as much as possible with my bum knee, yeah. which split us off a little bit further back. Then Shell's blaster jammed, so she got tagged. I went to see if she was tagged, realized she was, tried to backpedal, can't walk backwards very fast, was being charged by zombies, and then my blaster jammed. Also, I'm sorry, I'd love to bring up, what was your reasoning for using the Villainator for Shell? It's the most reliable blaster you could find. It's It definitely won't jam. It's not going to be that bad. Yeah, I do think that maybe somehow the cylinder got spun. I'm not sure. Unfortunately, when I tested it later, it worked just fine. So don't know what happened there. I, I trust yeah. me, Shell for like the next 30 minutes was complaining about that. Because you two split up for a while and she, as a zombie, was chasing me. And was still bringing up the Villainator for like a good 10 minutes afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Additionally, we when we say that we were having problems with not knowing things about zombies, we should probably talk about some of the things we didn't know with zombies. Right. So the the the, the basics of, of 
HV0, much like what we talked about in our previous episodes, where there are normal zombies, shield and pool noodle zombies, boomers, and either spitters or smokers or like throwers, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. We weren't exactly notified on how those zombies were going to specifically work. The normal zombies, the pool noodle and the shield zombies, those are fine. Those work pretty normally. Well, yes and no on the shield zombies, because That's right. we weren't told what tagged out the shield zombies. So, as previously mentioned, I've got two proud papas and a mighty mama on my moto blitz and firing mega to take out the shield zombies, which apparently that doesn't tag them out. Would have been nice to know that. Would have switched to shotgun shells if I'd known that. To be fair, the zombie didn't know that either and also called himself out when you hit him. The first time. Yes, the first time. (laughs) The second and third zombies I tried to tag out like that did not work. Correct. (laughs) Right. And then the two, in my opinion, the two biggest changes next to the Mega Dart, not uh, shield breaking, were uh, the spitters or the throwers, I I call them throwers. The thrower zombies in previous End Wars and most games that you play, the throwers stun, meaning that when you get hit with the ball, you're supposed to just get hit and you can't move. You're basically locked in place until somebody can tag you to bring you back. No. Apparently, uh, UNCC is famous for their throwers being insta-kills, meaning that anyone throwing those balls is not thrown to stun, they're thrown to kill. And that was very much not made apparent to us at all. We kind of found that out after the fact, and that was really, really upsetting. That was actually really maddening because mm-hmm. that's, that's, a, that's a huge change. That is a massive shift. Yeah. And the other one, which I think was our downfall, is the boomers, which they didn't necessarily have boomers. They had necromancers, or we called them necrons for short, but they had necromancers which work just like a boomer, but they're essentially always active. And what we had as a problem was whoever was the necromancer for like the squad of zombies with us kept on hanging really far back. And they would basically stay out of range and out of sight of us because the entire time we were told, hey, look out for special zombies. They have sashes on. That's what we're looking for. The entire hour, I didn't see a single sash. I come to find out from Shell, who joined the zombies, and from some of the other people, oh, the the Necromancer was always hiding behind the corner. Mm -hmm. Something that we had no knowledge of. The only reason we found out something was fishy was after, oh, what, 20 minutes, I realized, wow, these zombies are respawning really fast. Because the the timer is supposed to be on the twos, which, for, for those who don't understand that, every two minutes is a rolling respawn timer. So... You know, if it's 751, at 752, all zombies are respawned. And then at 754, all zombies are respawned. And at 756, they're all respawned. So it doesn't matter when you get out. On that rollover is when you get spawned in. So you could have a two-minute timer. You could have a 30-second timer. You could have a five-second timer. And additionally, the necro caused confusion for me as a zombie. Because initially, after I start playing again, after I went to put down our gear... I'm being told like every 20 seconds that I'm spawning back in. I don't know why, because no one's told me. And so then I ask multiple moderators about the rules for respawns because I was told it was on the twos previously. And I got three different answers from four different people. Yeah. So that caused some confusion for me as a zombie within the first 15. It it definitely created us a lot of problems. And I I, I don't know specifically how everyone else ended up faring for the the first game, but I I do know that our team seemingly had the hardest or one of the hardest pushes throughout mission one. And I'm not saying that to be like defensive or anything. I got out. Like the moral of the story is mission one, I lost. And I lost spectacularly and I'm proud of how I lost. And we'll get to that in a minute. But from, Lucky. <laughs> from from what I've heard from some of the other people, I think we had more of an isolated incident that like our zombies were the less informed ones because mm-hmm. they kept on responding super fast. They kept on they they, they kind of were very loosely using the rules for the zombies. And one of the other rules was when you respawn, you have to break line of sight. And I don't think people were using that correctly. I think they I were, don't think they were. Yeah, I think when they thought break line of sight, I think they meant if they hid behind 
a tree for half a second, that's breaking line of sight? Yeah, that was kind of the impression that I got. So when whenever we would hit zombies, they would be respawning within five to ten seconds and not even breaking line of sight. So when we ended up with a horde of like 10 or 12 of them, at, at a certain point, we just could not get them off our back. And it became a real problem. We, shortly after we lost Will, Shell, our, our, our Wish.com version of Drac, which I really hope we get a picture of Angus to show. because <laughs> Oh man, I hope we get a picture of Angus. <laughs> Angus was great. He's one of our locals. He's a really great guy. But I swear, he looked at, like, he found Drac's, like, order list for his toga costume and just, like, that but cheaper and just found a Wish.com version. His hair's quaffed the same way. It's, it's beautiful. I love it. I love it. I wanted him to amazing. just, I wanted him to constantly just follow Drac around and be like a stunt double. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah, as, as four of our, our, People get out. We're now half down to our squad. We have six people left. We end up cutting through this lovely little wooded uh, trail, and we lose two more people. Randall, God bless him, takes a huge stumble, falls, and him and our good friend Jacob get kind of separated. And for a while, we're kind of confused. Randall definitely seems hurt. He ended up, he actually really did hurt himself. We find out later that he really messed up his ankle uh, or knee. I think it was his knee. Sorry. It was his knee. Yeah. He really messed up his knee. And Jacob and him were never officially tagged out and they got separated from us. And we, we didn't know that we were so far apart. We didn't have any comms or anything. So at that point, I and a couple of the, the last of, of our group. So the final, I think three people we started with ended up diverting and we found the rest of our group that we came with. Originally, we found the, the first half of our SCNC group of guys. And so we reconnected. And they had already lost, I think, two or three people, too. So we ended up just being another group of ten again. As that's going on, we then learn that Randall and Jacob turn into basically a, a game of Call of Duty Black Ops slash Army of Two, where they're just now two men just dipping and diving between buildings, hiding everywhere, and just trying to just just like ghost mode this mission and and gotta love them they made it a solid 40 minutes on their own and did a did a bang up job and i really i appreciate their effort randall will also if you ask him incorrectly say that he found the very first artifact of the day which is incorrect because he doesn't have a podcast to explain this but we found the first artifact of the day without a doubt and it was the medusa's head uh-huh uh-huh <laughs> I was there when Randall took his stumble trying to run the artifact to the kill box. Oh, it was yeah, we... Angus that jumped out and scared it, or startled him and caused him to slip and fall. <laughs> That's right. Randall took two separate fumbles. That's right. Mm -hmm. oh, the wor man. second one was the worst one because he hit that one on brick. Mm -hmm. Oof, that's right. Yeah. So this is, mind you, all of that we just discussed, I think was the first seven, eight minutes. We had not hit 10 minutes, I think. Randall running with the artifact was about 30, 35 minutes in. No, sorry, no. So, sorry, previous to Randall and Jacob going on their own adventure, this is the first, like, 10 minutes of the event. Like, mm -hmm. HVZ has gone on 10 minutes, and we've lost half the people we started with. And because they thought Randall and Jacob were out, all the zombies started falling on our squad. We kept moving and hustling, and we found two artifacts. We ended up connecting with Dart Dragon, Daniel, another one of our local guys, along with Naptown Nerf, Jill and a couple other people. We had this massive squad of like 20, 30 people. And I'm like, oh, we're going to do it. We're going to be awesome. This is going to be great. And I incorrectly was listening to the wrong person because I could have swore someone told us, hey, we're too big. We need to split up. And so in my head, I'm like, cool, let's split up, guys. This is maybe five, six minutes later. So this is only like 15 minutes in. We end up splitting back up. And at the 20 minute mark, we're now back alone. We have two of the items and we're getting real tired. We're like, let's, you know, let's try to double back around. We find another item. So I think we have three items at this point. And for the life of me, I was not built for this amount of cardio. For those of you who don't know what I look like in person, because I'm using a digital avatar of something I made randomly. I'm a big guy. I'm a, I'm a real big guy and running cardio. Not, not my thing, not what I'm built for an hour in I was done. And the entire Charlotte campus is stairs. Everything is stairs. I feel bad for anyone in a wheelchair because it is all stairs. <laughs> it got to a point 
I think about 45 minutes in where, again, the zombies are not stopping. We cannot get a break. I'm barely getting enough break to grab water from my pouch and trying to take a sip. And we're running low. We lose five more people in our group. So we're now down to, I think, six more people total. So out of the 20 that started, five people are are left at about the 45 minute mark of mission one. And at that point, we come up to another staircase. And I look at the staircase. I look at all the zombies. And we've got one of the moderators. Uh, your partner is now chasing me down. Well, I guess <laughs> you you disappeared somewhere else. She is like, hey, look, I would just follow Josh and make fun of him the whole time. Yeah, I went back to the car to put the blasters away because I didn't want to leave them out in a publicly accessible meeting room. Came back, couldn't find her, stood by the kill box because I'm not chasing anybody down. I can't run, so (laughs) I'm just going to stay by the kill box and try to tag people, which I have to say nearly worked a couple of times. I just walked up to a group of human players wearing my bandana on my head and went, hey, what's up, guys? They start going, oh, yeah, hey, and I raise my hand to tag them. They realize at the last second, as my hand is in swing to tag them, that I'm a zombie <laughs> and tag me out. Happened two or three times where I just walked up, started talking to them, and they didn't realize that I was a zombie until I made the motion to tag. I I, I think I joked about that multiple times mm-hmm. going up to it. I'm like, look, no one expects the nonchalant zombie. Everyone mm-hmm. expects the running, shouting, chasing zombie. No one expects the jovial zombie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey yep. guys, how you doing? Have a good night. Really hot, right? Yeah, it's really, really sweltering. Tag. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason it didn't work was because there were enough people there to see what I was doing and, ta- and pop their blaster up and tag me. Right. If I had had a group of five less people, would have worked. <laughs> but, oh, dude, it, it got rough. And I can, I can picture all of the zombies because... Half of them I knew, because like I said, Shell was with us, Trenton, our friend, was with us. I wish I'd caught his name, the Dart Zone rep. He was a zombie with us, and Dart Sweep, Andrew Sarti, I believe is his name. Really cool dude. He was chasing us. Like I said, we had, I think, two of the mods. One guy in a without a shirt on, and I hope he had enough sunblock, because that guy would have died by the end end of the event. It was them, and I think like three or four others five of us we have three artifacts i look at the staircase and i'm i'm not i'm not built to go up these stairs again i'm i'm calling it quits right here and now so i grab the uh, ironically enough i had percy jackson's sword and i'm like what am i going to do with this artifact i turn around i throw it to one of our teammates i grab two mags out of my pocket and i tell my team run like the wind and I immediately opened up and I'm backing up trying to keep their attention. I lose a whole mag of darts. I go for the reload. Shirtless zombie that I hope doesn't have sun poisoning charges me. And I dodge him once. He looks at me like, how did this giant person dodge me? I look at him like, I don't know how I dodged him. We both kind of look at each other for a second. I'm still fumbling trying to put this mag in. He comes out for the lunge again. As I think I got the mag seated, I'm about to hit him. And I drop the mag. And I get tagged. <laughs> and I I fall to my knees. Doves kind of fly up into the air. It was just the most poetic moment I could have had as I fall. And I turn to my teammate as they're running up the stairs. And it, it very much felt like the, the climactic ending of, of an actual zombie movie. <laughs> and I felt, I felt proud as I went down and then had to sit there for about 10 minutes as shell. And I were like trying to figure out how I'm going to take all this shit back to the car. <laughs> <laughs> Been watching a lot of uh, a lot of John Woo movies. Yeah, John Woo movies lately. <laughs> Tons of John Woo movies. I, I just got done watching Face Off before we started recording. I started that. <laughs> <laughs> but in in all honesty, I I'm sad I got out in Mission One, and I'm sad that I I led us to our deaths. That being said, the five people I pushed out and you know led to their their survival. All but one of them made it to the finals. Mm-hmm. They all made it to the last stand. So I'm I'm calling my sacrifice as as part of that. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Now that being said, the rest of them are incredibly fit young people. Terrell can run six miles, no problem. Mm-hmm. Will and Scott are young kids. 
Robert, unfortunately, whiffed it and didn't make it, but the rest of them were just sprinting fools, so of course they made it. <laughs> so uh, that was that. I think we had about 10 minutes left in Mission 1 uh, at that point, and from what I understand, there was either 12 or 24 artifacts. No clue. I think five of them got turned in because I was just standing yeah. by the kill box the entire time. Same. Uh, I think from from what I heard during the event, it was it was twelve. That being said, I heard conflicting information later that it was actually twenty four items. No, you heard conflicting information. I don't believe that. That doesn't sound like this event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as as much fun as I personally had during mission one, I got out. That sucked. It was bad. Will, you and Shell stayed on campus pretty much the rest of the day mm-hmm. as zombies. I I had to go home, or I, I didn't go home. I had to go back to the hotel for a while. I had to change. I had to kind of decompress. I came back onto campus, I think, for Mission 3 for a while, mm-hmm. and we got to hang out for a bit. Yeah. But the the heat was real bad. Mm-hmm. It I think it, it, it peaked at over 100 degrees at a, at a certain point. You know, as I previously mentioned, I work outside on asphalt. I'm used to the heat, and it was taking a lot even out of me. Yeah. I refilled my camelback, which is a two liter camelback, three times. I drank about six liters of water throughout the day. So, yeah. anybody who is, you know, not used to that heat and uh, not saying as hydrated as I was, was probably struggling. Now, admittedly, there were people who were still running all day long. I don't know how they did it. I'm, I'm saying mm-hmm. it's because they're young. I'm going to go with that. But yeah, I mean, there were people who in mission three where I'm stumbling along, struggling to stay upright because my legs are hurting and I'm tired and overheated. They're booking it. And I don't know how they managed it. Roger, the head of the North Carolina HVZ club was. Oh, yeah. The the head. Yeah. The head mod. Yeah. He was that dude. That dude's a machine. That dude is on cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. We, we can either confirm or deny the drug allegations that we have just disclosed here on Scruffy Nerf Herders podcast. Yes. I'm choosing to believe that he was hiding saline packs underneath his shirt, and he just had IVs plugged into all of his body to keep himself hydrated. But yes, that guy is yeah. insane. Don't know how he managed to do that, but he would, you know, trundle along, and then he'd see a human, and he'd just shoot off into the distance. Dude had passion. So I guess with that, I should probably talk about Mission 2. Yeah, go for it. Let's talk about the the rest of the missions, because sadly, I did not come back as zombie for most of this. So Mission 2, there's a bit of a break, and we go in and we get our mission orders, so to speak. There was a little confusion about where zombies were meeting before Mission 2 started. We had been previously told at the end of Mission 1 that we were meeting outside of the student union. That got changed to outside the clock tower. We show up. There's barely any zombies. There were more zombies in Mission 1 than were at Mission 2. And I think a lot of people, it was, you know, they were getting overheated. They needed to take a break. Some people I know mm-hmm. decided to leave after they became a zombie. So there's probably only like 20 of us who were zombies for Mission 2, which is not money. The rules that were outlined to us were there would be a number of moderators around campus who would be carrying red handkerchiefs with letters on them. The goal of the humans was to find these moderators and get the letters and then take them back to some central location we didn't know where and use those letters to decode a message from the gods. Additionally, the campus was laid out to be a labyrinth. There were special movement rules for humans. They could only go upstairs, not down. There would be cones laid out across pathways with arrows. The humans could only cross the cones in the direction the arrow pointed. Zombies can go up and down stairs and can go any direction through the cones, but humans were limited to those movement options. Additionally, there were special zombies that were themed after Greek mythology. Uh, The Minotaur could not be tagged, but was not allowed to run. And it was the tank, basically. Yeah. And also had to follow the same movement rules as the humans. Achilles could only be tagged out by hitting cake tins on his back. Yep. Scylla had a basket full of stuffed animals that, when tagged, she would throw up in the air. Any humans that were tagged by those stuffed animals would be out, and she would only respawn when she had gathered back up all of her stuffed animals. And Oh, no, that was not Scylla. I'm sorry, I can't remember who that was. Scylla had pool noodles wrapped all around her body so that she could spin humans with her many, many pool noodles. And Arachne was able to throw a stuffed animal on a rope and pull it back to her. 
sorry, no, Scylla was the beanie baby stuffed animal person. Arachne was both pool noodle and had the, the launcher. You're right. Correct. Yeah. The, the pool noodles were supposed to be their legs. Yes. So as zombies, we wander around for a little bit. We find in a far off corner, one of the muses who's handing out these letters. And as we understood it, the humans had to gather letters from each of the muses in order to decode the message. So we look at the position went, there's a staircase right there. There's an open parking lot area right here, but it's got bushes, so it limits the movement of the players. And on the other side of us is cones, which they cannot cross. So we're just going to sit here and guard this. And we sat there for almost two hours, no sign of any humans. And then finally some humans start coming up and we get in position and we start getting ready. We start falling to humans because there's only six or seven of us sitting here. And then we turn around and there had been a moderator there talking to the muse and the moderator and the muse are gone. So we looked around and went, we don't know what's going on. So then we look back where the cones are that had been our back line. Those are also gone and the tape arrow is gone. So we start heading back towards the student union because at this point we don't know what to do. Get back, find out that supposedly the objective had been completed. I talked to Dark Dragon and he said that, you know, humans had completed the mission, which I didn't understand how that was possible because in our understanding, humans had to collect letters from each muse. According to some people I talked to who were humans, they said that they had gathered most of the letters and then went back to the central location and were able to guess the missing letter letters that they would have gotten from our location. So in the human's mind, they completed the objective. However, start of mission three happens. And the zombies are told the humans failed to complete the objective because they had not gotten those last letters. So we were all, once again, armed with pool noodles, balls, and shields because the humans had failed to complete the objective. That led to a little bit of a problem there because we were also told due to some incidents of balls from spitters being thrown into roads, it was now a strike, three strikes in your objective from the game. If you were a spitter or smoker, and your ball went into the road, which meant that humans then started hugging the roads. Yeah, this is, I think, what, number two or three of, like, mm -hmm. big issues that started getting abused. Additionally, during mission three, yeah. there were there was one group of humans that I know just ran from one door to the other on the student union, which was marked as a safe zone. So we couldn't ever tag them out because they were never actually in a spot where we could tag them. Now, props to the moderators. When we told them about this, Roger went in and kicked them all out and said, you can't just keep doing this. This is not the point of the mm -hmm. game. But it was a bit of a problem that lasted for a good hour. You know, I should probably talk about the rules for Mission 3 before I start going into Mission 3. Zombies are pulled all up into one room up in the student union. Humans went to another one to receive their briefing. Zombies are told that there are a number of moderators walking around with tablets and our goal is to, as zombies is to tag out humans and if we tag moderators with the tablets they cannot move for four minutes not on the fours they cannot move for four minutes we were not told where they were going or where they were supposed to meet up and i'm not entirely certain that humans were told either it sounds from what i've heard that humans were told they needed to wander around a certain distance and then Groups needed to meet up and switch tablets with each other. So that that's actually where I, I learned about this because uh, I was talking with a buddy who was doing this mission. Mm -hmm. uh, the tablets had riddles on them, and those riddles corresponded with specific locations on campus. And so the whole point was each person, each of the NPCs had different riddles to tell them to go to different locations. We, we all kind of noticed a pretty glaring issue at that point, and uh, from what I understand, hints were given and whatnot, but the majority of people have been on this campus, oh, five, six hours tops right now, collective. I don't think they have a photographic memory of all of the locations and places yes. down to where they could probably guess riddles. So I think that's where a lot of the problems came out, where... They're like, oh, hey, we need to go find such and such place, but mm -hmm. no one bothered to look up a map or, you know, take yeah, a quick exactly. bus tour that they were given out to figure out the stuff. So I know Jake, he was one of the moderators with the tablets. His team, Jake's team, just pieced out and left him. They said, nope, we want to make it yep, to Mission 4 and <laughs> ran off, which, once again, 
there were several big issues in Mission 3, particularly with player, human players abusing the rules in order to try to make it to Mission 4 and the final stand. I followed people around for yeah. two hours. Wasn't much of a threat, to be honest. I was too tired to throw a ball accurately. And then on top of that, once again, as we mentioned, a lot of human teams were keeping to the roads. I wasn't risking a strike to throw a ball because a ball will roll. So even if I don't throw it into the road, it can roll into the road. We probably should actually bring up the point of the strikes. We actually didn't talk about that. This is true. Like, so for, for those who are wondering, like, what are the strikes we're talking about? UNCC had a very strict three strike policy for both humans and zombies. Everybody who uh, came to the event and registered was given a card. So a business card, which I have problems with how they did that only because I work as a printer for a living. So I'll... <laughs> you, you don't use gloss coated material and try to write on with a gel pen. Mm -hmm. You need Sharpies or leave it on. Sorry, tangent over. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, there was, they had three strikes. So whether you're human and you ran across the road without using a crosswalk or you're a zombie with an infraction, basically you had three strikes before you're ejected from the game. No questions asked, nothing, mm -hmm. you know, strikes are out. So it got to a certain point that both humans and zombies started exploiting some of these very specific rules, such as throwers can't throw a ball in the street without getting a strike. Mm -hmm. So no, basically no one's going to go in the middle of the, the campus because if they're near a road, they're basically nullifying throwers. You'd additionally, because of the rule that you can't play in the road, which good rule, absolutely smart rule, humans would then stand on one side of the crosswalk and zombies could not cross to tag them, mm -hmm. uh, which was another rule that was causing issues for the zombie players. And to be fair, we, my team did do that for about 20 seconds as a joke and then we immediately crossed the street and went down yeah so but we didn't camp there camp there but we did we did park there for a joke yeah so I, and you know i mean i'm fine with it whatever if you walk up to a crosswalk you see a bunch of zombies across the road you're like yeah maybe let's not go that way that's fine the issue that i saw was human teams camping the crosswalk right to protect themselves from the zombies because the zombies can't cross because the instant they cross, they're tagged out. And so once again, it was exploits of the rules that I don't think were getting heavily enforced. And I'm not going to blame the moderators from that. There were only so many moderators versus players, but it was something that I was seeing happen a lot towards the end of Mission 3. Yeah, for sure. Also in Mission 3, I think we can also bring up the point and I don't think a lot of people noticed it. I think it was either three or the very beginning of four. We finally figured out what the beads were that they gave us. Yeah. I think that was mission <laughs> four because I didn't find out anything about it. So, okay. Okay. Sorry. That, that was mission. Yeah. Four. I'm not positive by yeah. mission four. I'll be honest. I had gone back to the hotel room because I desperately needed a shower and was overheated and needed food. So I pieced out by mission yeah. four, but I had also been, walking around in the hot sun for six hours by that point and gone through six liters of water. So, yeah. Um, and that's, that's a, that's another point. And I think we'll, we'll touch that after, I mean, actually at this point, because unfortunately we don't have a ton of info about mission four mm -hmm. to, the, to the best of my knowledge, mission four was a four point capture location where they divided up all of the humans into four groups that had to go to these specific locations and defend them until the timer ran out, basically. So the last stand divided into, I think, four groups, or like it was some sort of like continuous thing. If they were able to hold it for X amount of time, mm -hmm. they could go to the next one. Because like the last stand uh, was uh, from from the videos and what I I've understood was less uh, grandiose than it had been in the past. And the humans ended up winning, mm -hmm. funny enough, which is an end war first. Yep. So. I'm actually genuinely surprised about that. So that's actually really, really cool. Mm -hmm. I I fully support humans winning. I know I have friends and colleagues that I vehemently disagree with on this point that zombies have to win. I disagree. Mm -hmm. But this this does kind of bring up into kind of the problems. So for reference, be only because I just brought it up a second ago. Everybody was given three beads on a on a pipe cleaner. Basically, everyone was given a bracelet with three beads. And those beads were supposed to be donated to a shrine of their god of their choosing, which they got to pick at the beginning of the game. 
there was some sort of thing connected to that. I unfortunately cannot attest to who won that or whatever did win for whatever reason. But I think that just kind of leads into another thing that almost could have been perfect in my opinion. There's a lot of things here that I think if they were given more than six weeks would have been better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is obviously, you know, with, with the, the case of hindsight, with the case of getting to experience and play test it, we definitely got to see some of the bugs and some of the problems that most people wouldn't have thought of or gotten to ahead of time. And so, I mean, at this point, I, I can definitely say, I think the game was run as well as it could have been given all of the time constraints. I'm surprised it was run as well as it could have been that it was given the time constraints. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I think at most they were 15, 20 minutes late to start, but they kind of kept up to it. Mm -hmm. I think at one point they hit 30 minutes, but I mean, they condensed an entire weekend event into about a 12 hour time frame. So they, they, they did the best they could with what they were given. So all of all of the negatives, all of the complaining we're really about to do and what we've kind of been doing, please take with a grain of salt that they they genuinely did the best that they could. Mind you, given six weeks, mm -hmm. I can tell you 2019 End War had six months and they decided to not plan until about the month ahead. <laughs> so depending on who you ask, they had a weekend to plan and you can kind of tell. So... UNCC, I swear, did a beautiful job, and they did a great thing. That being said, I have notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, same. So, and and this is this is just an obvious one, and like I said, this is probably just maybe for our group. I can't say that that was for everybody, but we weren't told about the zombies. We weren't sure how they were going to react. The uh, the throwers. I'm not going to lie. I I did cheese. At the very beginning, I actually got hit by a thrower literally 20 seconds after starting the game. It, it bounced and hit my foot, so I counted that as it hitting the ground first, so I didn't want to call it. But at first, I thought it was a stun. Mm -hmm. It was a straight-up kill, so that, that was shocking to me. No one else understood that. No one else knew what was going on. There was so many small problems that some of it, yes, was addressed in the, the, the safety briefing. And stuff like that, but we had no idea how the zombies were going to work. No one explained the necromancers. It was very, very vague <laughs> because they wanted to keep some mystery. The the division of doing all the god pantheons, while fun, didn't make any sense until literally the final mission. And at that point, a lot of us didn't care. And uh, after I realized that we were supposed to use these beads for something in mission four. I realized those beads actually would have been a much more interesting item. And this is something that I don't think anyone in Endwar has done, but it's something that I think could be utilized very easily. Everybody was given three beads on a pipe cleaner to use as a bracelet. Why not have those beads be points, uh, essentially, or lives? One of the things that people really hate is getting out because they don't understand a rule, getting out because of an accident, something, yada, yada, yada. Well, everyone had three beads. What if you had three lives? People would be a lot more gutsy. People would be a lot more ballsy. Zombies would have a much harder time. Yes, maybe not do three, but have those beads. Mm -hmm. So, And whenever a zombie tags you, you give that zombie that tagged you a bead. So it gives zombies a tangible prize. And whoever has the most tags at the end of the event could have you know gotten a special prize, something what have you, special kudos, something to that effect. But that also gives humans a little bit of wiggle room. Mm -hmm. Because at least in, in our effect for mission one, we got unrelentedly you know, stomped on. We got barely a second to breathe. They were on us the whole time. So I, I would have much preferred to have been able to sacrifice a bead and come back in later. You know, Give me a 10 minute respawn timer or something to come back in. I would have gladly taken that. And at the end, I would have had less beads to give to my god and maybe have failed the final stand or mission three because those beads could have then gone to something more interesting where we had a bunch of tanks or what have you. Like, you know, if, if no gods got enough beads, then, you know, an extra tank showed up. Yeah. Some, something to that effect. I feel like there's these little things that definitely could have been fixed or tweaked. That was, that was my biggest one that I think I saw. And I would love to talk to maybe a moderator 
or other HVZ organizers to see how that maybe would have played out or if they've tried something like that before. Yeah, agreed. Uh, something else we talked about, and you know, this is something that would have had to have gone through the campus, was maybe if they had closed the roads. Don't know, yeah. don't know how possible that would have been, but there were empty buses going continuously through the campus. If they'd been able to close the roads because, you know, it's summer, summer classes are over, nobody's in the residential halls. If they'd been able to close that, that would have eliminated, say, the problem with zombies going, oh, I can't throw at players by a road. Or or at least maybe most of the roads. Like, mm-hmm. I understand, like, the major roads and stuff, but there was a couple of smaller, like, crosswalk areas that, like, were just to access, like, roads to the back or something. So, yeah. Yeah, the, that obviously, because again, that kind of comes back down to they only had six weeks. Mm-hmm. So trying to close down, you know, a campus also probably would have been a little more costly. Probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's a thought maybe in the future for HVZs. If you've got enough time and your campus is amenable, talk to them about that. Make it possible. It makes the game a lot safer. It makes it so that there's fewer exploits available to people both humans and zombies, to abuse. It's a thought. I mean, I don't know if it would work. You'd have to go campus by campus, administration by administration, club by club. Yeah. I know, for example, where I went to college is very small. There's no roads through campus, just around the campus. So that would have been a very, that wouldn't even been a necessary thing to do because there's no place anybody could go except for the main campus. Right. Um, and yeah, as about to say, I think even Statesboro for, for what I, for what I remember, I don't think there was any like through roads either. So there was very little reason to have to worry about shutting down a road. Mm-hmm. So it, it definitely is a campus by campus basis. Yeah. Charlotte is massive with many, many roads. Yeah. There's a, there's a moving bus system that was very regular. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a thought. I'm not saying, Hey, you guys definitely should have done this. I'm not saying this is a problem that you guys should have addressed. I'm just saying. It's something that I noticed. It's a thought that I discussed with other people and could have enhanced the play. But maybe they tried and were voted down by the administration. I don't know. I really, yeah. I, I, I'm not privy to that. And I'm not going to criticize somebody on something that I don't know. Just a thought for other event organize, organizers. Here's something that you might want to consider. Uh, another thing that I kind of want to be a little nitpicky on only because they the UNCC had enough time to make a informational video for their safety briefing. I wish they had done an informational video for their gameplay rules. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of things that were were very much a shock to veteran players, to new players. I mean, our our episode has factually wrong information because I incorrectly assumed that they would be using some more traditional hvz rules Mm -hmm. obviously you know every camp is going to do it a little different but like this this kind of goes out to again we only had six weeks very little information was given to us ahead of time the rules themselves were really only given to us maybe a week in advance Mm -hmm. and there was more complaint about some of the specific rules and i think in just a second we'll get back to kind of like the drama of the weekend so to speak but yeah obviously communicating with the guests and communicating with us better would not have hurt in any way shape or form i i can't imagine giving your players more information would have been a problem yes all right so let's talk about some of the drama of the weekend some of the things that before and were even started we were hearing people complain I, I can tell you, first and foremost, one of the guys that came up with me would not stop complaining about this. And I know he's listening, and I love you, Willie, but man, you would not shut up about this. <laughs> one of the big rules that University of North Carolina Charlotte had was the lack of tactical gear for their events. Back in, I believe it was 2018 or 2019, they had an active shooter situation, and so on campus there are no chest rigs, tactical vests, plate carriers, any any sort of excessive amount of tactical gear is incredibly discouraged and was not to be allowed. And the people who were coming were not happy about that. People were complaining left and right. It kind of came out of nowhere, at least from a, from a player's point of view. A lot of people were just very upset because they were expecting to be all tactical, having all their gear and stuff, and lost their minds Mm -hmm. and to to 
me and for for the most for most of us it wasn't that big of a deal like yeah some of us were planning on using chest rigs but so be it we'll we'll make an adapt where we're guests on this campus we're guests to this local community we don't need to make it harder for them because then there's less chance of us ever coming back Mm -hmm. so for everyone who did accommodate you guys are the champions for everyone who was nice enough to not give everyone a you know a big pain in the ass you know, trying to skirt past being like, well, my tactical gear doesn't look that bad, so it should be okay. Like, for those of you who didn't bring your chest rigs and just showed up with, like, a battle belt, you're the MVPs for, for the HVZ. The the big weird one that threw a lot of people off and, in my opinion, was a little more controversial was the concealment of blasters while inside school buildings. That was a weird one that threw a lot of people off because I understand what they're trying to get at. They don't want to have people walking around with, you know, gun looking items, but wouldn't it be more awkward to have a bunch of people with like cloaked bulges everywhere? Like it, it it looks far worse to have a bunch of people conspicuously trying to hide stuff than just being out in the open with a big old bright blue thing. Mm -hmm it definitely threw a lot of people off. A lot of people had problems with that. Some people couldn't even go into the student union because of the gear they had. The reason that we got delayed at the beginning of mission one was because my friend Ray was in just shorts and a t-shirt and had a battle belt and stuff, but he wasn't allowed to bring his blaster in. He wasn't allowed to bring his dump pouches in. Like everything was like disallowed to bring in. Mm -hmm. So it, it definitely was, was problematic for some people. And it just, it seemed like a very, Odd rule. Again, we're guests. We obliged. We did our best to not argue, but I, I definitely agree with a lot of the other people that like that was a weird rule. Let's let's look less like active shooters by trying to look like we're hiding something. <laughs> Come on, guys. Yeah. Uh, additionally, there were people with chest rigs. Yes. They showed up and then were told that they just had to put bright colored tape on their chest rigs and other tactical gear, which you're going to make a rule, guys. Please enforce it across the board. So there there was, like, they did eventually make that omission later that, like, as long as it was bright, colorful enough, mm-hmm. you could get away with it. But at, at that, I, I agree. At that point, stick to your guns, guys. Mm-hmm. Like, it's if, if that is going to break your time to come, then you shouldn't have come to begin with because I, that's, that is such a minuscule part. Mm-hmm of the experience and if that's going to kill it for you then please don't come yeah this is also a very obvious complaint too and this is something that again because they only had you know six weeks to plan this and they had to kind of condense this it was a problem i think the reason we had so few zombies in the final stand and the reason we had so few people come back for the later missions was because this was all in one day we only had a 12 hour time frame to put in four plus missions and a lunch break into into this event. People were gassed. Like the, the people who made it beyond mission two and were still raring to go, they're they're champions. They are a breed above because I barely made it through mission one before I was gassed unable to breathe. So uh th- like I said, nature of the beast, I definitely recommend you know in the future w- working around that. But <laughs> Yeah, the one day definitely killed it for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, very, very true. I mean, by the next day when we start talking about FPT, a lot of people had very little left to give. Now, I, I once again, I want to thank the University of North Carolina Nerf Club. You guys did an awesome job. For all of our complaints, you guys did an awesome job. You put it together in six weeks, and I don't know if I could have managed to do a third, a quarter of what you guys did with the time that you were given. For sure. So. Everybody please can take our complaints with a grain of salt because we're coming in as people who just showed up for an event, not people who had to deal with administration and, you know, and more staff and not having enough time and all of that stuff. Look, as somebody who constantly has to get Drax attention, I fully sympathize with them having to, for the last six weeks, keep him on a call. <laughs> so I, I 100% empathize. They are the real champions. <laughs> that man is impossible so to, to respond back to you. <laughs> I, I'm kidding, of course. A little bit. 
so yeah, we can, we obviously we're, we're, we're criticizing and complaining from a point of privilege and from a point of hindsight. Obviously UNCC did not have this level of hindsight before, you know, setting this up. So again, UNCC, you guys are fantastic. We thank you. And I would not be mad to have to come back there again for an invitational or another end war or something like that. It was fantastic. Yes. And that is where we are going to end it for this episode. Please join us for part two. We'll be posting it soon. Thanks, and we'll see you on the next episode.